Okay. Well, we're here. The last sermon in Acts. It's been a long time. Almost three years. And, uh, of course, we took some breaks. But we're here, verses 17 through 31. And we're going to be looking at it. Um, there's several points there, especially on the outline if you're taking notes. And it's kind of broken down. The gospel defense, the gospel curiosity, gospel convincing, gospel reversal, and gospel continuation. Because ultimately, Acts doesn't really end. It's kind of a dot, dot, dot. You know, you you've kind of trail off when you have a thought or you quote somebody or something like that. It, we don't know really what happens with Paul. We don't know a lot. Uh, we know from history, but not explicitly from Acts. Second Timothy is Paul's last letter that he writes, and we know a little bit more, and that most people believe was a different time he was in Rome later on. Most believe he was released in the custody we see him now, and was then made his way further west, and eventually got arrested again, brought back to Rome, and was eventually martyred. Because the prison he was in here is drastically different than another Roman prison he was in later on. There's a few other things there we won't get into too much, but... Paul is, is, is still working, even though we see him kind of wrapping up here. One thing to kind of note about Rome, and it's a good thing to know, is that there's about 2 million people packed in the city right now. 2 million, 2,000 years ago. <laughs> uh, there's about a million of them are slaves. There's roughly a dozen synagogues, which we'll look at here in a moment, of different Jewish leaders. Synagogues are basically like churches, right? And that's already happening, plus there's a big Christian community we saw last week. We see it a little bit more this week, although the focus, again, is on the Jewish people, Paul's kinsmen. Paul makes six defenses for himself in Acts. This is the last one. It's a very brief one. And he talking to his Jewish kinsmen. And we'll read the text in a moment. But there's a reason why he did this. This was his habit. He always went to the synagogues first, right? He went because they had an open door. Uh, there was a lot of dialogue, and it was kind of like almost Sunday school where there'd be questions and answers, and there'd be teaching and, and preaching and reading from the, the book of uh, Moses or some of the prophets or whatever, the Old Testament, right? And there were times that, you know, someone had a word. Well, of course, Paul's Jewish as well, ethnically, so uh, he would go, and many others would go there as well. And then later on, they'd go to the Gentiles. We saw this time and time again in many different places and Rome is no different. The one thing to note, too, is that the Jewish people are expecting the Messiah. They're expecting the promised one. The Gentiles, not so much, right? They might see the world's cursed or broken or something like that, but they're not expecting a Redeemer or a Messiah like the Jews were. But still, there's much res resistance. And remember, this is about 30 or so, 32 years later after the crucifixion and resurrection. In Acts 1, we see Jesus tell his disciples, go to Jerusalem, wait for me. The Holy Spirit comes in tongues. 3,000 plus people are saved, etc. And all those people are Jewish. Sometimes kind of people forget that. I'm not sure why, but all the first Christians were Jewish. So there was plenty of Jewish people who became Christians, not everybody, but many, many, and even still to a degree today. But we can see that the open door is for the gospel, and they're already expecting it. Just like if we were to have something today where someone's already anticipating something happening, like you know, an election, for example, or, or who won the Super Bowl, or something like that. We know about it, and then someone tells them, like, oh, okay, we talk about that, we understand it. Obviously, much, much larger is the redemption, the, the gospel, the good news. It's not just a New Testament thing. Of course, it's an Old Testament thing that was promised even in Genesis 3. So Paul's here, talking to his kinsmen, town of two million, a city of two million people plus, half of them are slaves, very squalor, bad conditions, ramshackle kind of, you know, huts and, you know, all basically like tent cities kind of thing. Many of them are built up. That's why Rome, if we know later on, Nero burned Rome, built the thing. That's why it built, burned up quick because it was all wood, or most of it was. Very fascinating and remember, good to remember the background there. And Paul writes several of his letters, which we'll get into in a moment, in this imprisoned state, in this place called Rome. 
I know you just sat, but if you wouldn't mind standing one more time in the honor of the Lord's word, we're going to read verses 17 through 31 from Acts chapter 28. After three days, Luke writes, he called together the local leaders of the Jews, and when they had gathered, he said to them, Brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. When, <clears throat> when they had examined me, they wished to set me at liberty, because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But because of the Jews, because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, though I had no charge to bring against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak to you, since it is because of the hope of Israel I'm wearing this chain. And this and they said to him, we have not received any letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you. But we desire to hear from you, desire to hear from you what your views are. And with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging. In greater numbers. And from morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. And disagreeing amongst themselves, they departed after Paul and had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, you will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed. Lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and what? I would heal them. Verse 28. Therefore, let it be known to you and that and to, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. And he lived in his house two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Pray with me. God, thank you for Paul's testimony. Thank you for his boldness. Thank you for his conviction. Thank you that the gospel is for everyone, not just Jews, not just Gentiles. May we have this passion and this zeal. May we keep the main thing, the main thing. May we know that you are the God who saves, but also you give people over who routinely and relentlessly close their eyes, shut their ears, and harden their hearts. But when someone turns, as you promise, you are the one who heals. May we have hearts like children, Lord. May we be as Jesus calls us to be, both here and now and in our lives, around us, at work, at home, in our neighborhoods, at the store. Help us to be tender as children, gentle as doves, seasoned with salt in our speech. Thank you for this testimony. Thank you for your promises, Lord. For they are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. To his name I pray. Amen. I'll be seated. Thank you. So kind of micro bits as we see verses 17 through 20, and then the second point, 21 through 22, third point, 23, 24, fourth point, 25 through 29, and then last point, 30 and 31. And again, we see Paul here giving his defense yet again, calling after three days. He doesn't, you know, he gets to work. He's not there, but long, just a couple days, few days calls the local leaders, probably could have gone to them, maybe with his freedom, but possibly not. And it's, again, there's a dozen synagogues, so let's gather them over here as opposed to hitting each one. So that's likely why he's doing that. We can see that it's just easier, right, to get that. Not just probably um, pastors, if you will, of the synagogues, but likely merchants and other men of, of renown, possibly Jewish women as well, um, in the city, right, in the community. And what's he doing? He's proclaiming Jesus. But first he gives his defense, doesn't he? And that's his gospel defense. He's on trial because of the hope of Israel. Well, 
who or what is the hope of Israel? Jesus, right? Sunday school answer. <laughs> Jesus is the hope of Israel. That's why he's still wearing this chain. And he references this several times. And if you know the pastoral epistles or specifically the prison epistles, namely Ephesians or Philippians, he references the chain. We saw that even in Acts 26, he's still got the chain. And he's talking to the magistrate and he says, and he, the magistrate, right, he says, you want me to become a Christian too? And he says, yes, absolutely. I want you to be just as I am except for the chain. I don't want you to be in prison, even though he's, he's his enemy. But we can see that Paul here is making a defense yet again for the last time. And he talks to them and he doesn't say, really, I have anything against you. And he does this because of his appeal. He has to appeal to Caesar because of the Jews objecting. Remember some of the guys, they were taking an oath. They were going to kill themselves before. <laughs> they're going to kill Paul before they eat, right? Curious how many people starve to death, but that's another story. It's very zealous nonetheless. Paul escapes and escapes and escapes, and here he is. Well, we can see here that he is delivered into the hands of the Romans, and they've examined him, verse 18. They wished to set me at liberty, but he said, there was no, and there was no reason, right? And there isn't a reason. Paul's innocent. And even the Romans are always scratching their heads like, I don't understand why there's a problem. Why do you have an issue? I don't get it. And even the Jews really can't have a reason. They don't have a reason either. Other than they just don't want to submit to Jesus, right? Verse 19, the Jews objected, it says. I was compelled to answer to Caesar. Of course, that was the Romans' right to do, a Roman citizen's right. They didn't just do it all the time because Caesar's kind of important, right? But they had that ability. And then last verse of the first point, verse 20. For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you, since it is because of the hope of Israel I'm wearing this chain. So he ends his defense right there. The first defense, his first gospel defense. Why am I here? What are we doing? Yet again, he's talking about this. He's not condemning the Jewish people. He's not attacking them. He's simply defending himself. Listen, this is what I did. This is what God had do. He didn't tell about the time of the Damascus Road, but he tells that other times. Could have, I suppose. Maybe Luke doesn't record it. That's okay. Either way. But he's here calling to the Jewish people, much more larger group of people, than he sees in other areas. Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, he's the hope of Israel. He's the one that you should submit to. He is the promised Messiah. Come to him. That's what Paul's saying. Ephesians 6.20, Paul, at the end of that great book, says he's an ambassador in chains, right? If you know it. And what does he say? That's the famous passage, put on the whole what of God? What's it called? The armor of God. That's right. He's chained to a Roman citizen. And when you know this, when you know Ephesians was written in this exact point, then you realize he's looking at the Roman guy who's probably, you know, 10 feet from him, and he's looking at his armor. An, a soldier equipped for fighting. And Paul says, put on the whole armor of God. Using what his situation is here, not pretending to be a victim, not saying, woe is me, my life is terrible, I can't believe this, I'm wrongfully in prison, I'm going to call my lawyer, I can't, this is terrible, right? He uses this opportunity to write to the Ephesian church. It says, put on the whole armor of God. He doesn't say they're not soldiers. He doesn't say they're not fighting. Soldiers fight, Right? Soldiers fight for the right cause. They fight for their side. They fight, in this case, for Christ. Now, of course, he's talking spiritually, yes, but there are still times to pick up arms, yes, as well. But that's not his point, ultimately. He's using this in a much broader, bigger, deeper way to say, fight for Christ. Put on the whole armor of God, which requires us and them, us by extension, and them, he's writing to the Ephesians, to do something. Don't just wander around in war like we're dressed right now. <laughs> you know, you got to have your breastplate and your helmet. Get your spear and sword. Or modern day, get a helmet and, you know, an M16 or something. Get your boots on. Put on your knee pads, etc. 
So Paul is using, Paul's writing Ephesians. He's also writing Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon as well in this time. So when you read those books next time, know that Paul's in prison. Sometimes those are called the prison epistles, prison letters. That's what, that's the context. And when we know this, and I've said this too many times, but I'll say it again, Acts is that umbrella where everything else falls under. All the other letters are written in this time, or at least, you know, 95% of them. It's so helpful, Paul's letters that is, to know that, and we see the kind of branches out where these things go. It's not just this discombobulated, like a jigsaw puzzle and all the pieces are just scattered. So many people kind of approach the Bible like that and they just hold up one piece and it's like, I don't know, this looks good. Let me just kind of, you know, shove it in there. <laughs> we ever tried to do that, put the puzzle piece in wrong? And you're just like, I think it fits. You're like, People do that all the time with theology though, right? With the Bible, they'll pick and choose. Oh, this is what this means. Is it though? My old pastor said, and many others say, context is king. And it's not just the context in the scripture, though. It's, that's very helpful. It isn't just that. Where is Paul writing? Why is he writing? Or in other cases, John or Peter or James. Who is he writing to? When is he writing? Where, if we know, is he writing? Well, Paul writes Ephesians. He writes Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon in prison. Much different than some of the other letters. So it's good to remember that. And ultimately, this whole study of Acts, by the way, I hope it's not something to say, okay, I've done that, we're good. Church went through that, pastor went through that, great. I hope it drives you to study it further. Because Acts is a very rich book, and I hope you've seen that over this time. Because it is. It's not just about miracles and the early church and persecution and this and that. Yeah, that's part of it. But there's so much more of God's promises, how the church grows, how things are happening, God's faithfulness, and all this other stuff with the umbrella being Acts and these other things falling in. You know, it's not the Bible wasn't written one book after another, you know, year 31, year 32, year 33. There's overlap. And obviously, I think sometimes we do ourselves a disservice or even the chapters and verse breaks do us a disservice unintentionally. But I mean, even Luke was written and then we have John and then Acts. I mean, why isn't Luke and Acts next to each other, volume one and volume two? Like, it makes no sense. But anyway, Mark was written first, not Matthew. Like, it's kind of all over the place. But it's good to remember that and just not fall into the trap of kind of thinking it's all chronology or something. Anyway, second point. So they see this curiosity. Look at it with me. Verse 21, they said to him, we have received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here have reported or spoken any evil about you. But we desire to hear. There's that curiosity. We desire to hear from you what your views are with regard to this sect that we know every, that everywhere is spoken against. So they clearly know there's Christians, right? And it's not spoken well of. It's spoken against. Now, we'll just believe them. It's kind of weird in one sense because Paul's like, he was arrested a couple years ago. Now, this is the fish first ship with the winter coming in. But he was in Caesarea for two years, right? He's already been arrested in Rome. And we go to Caesarea. This is, you know, Acts 22, 23, 24, into 26. And, you know, they got shipwrecked in Malta, verse chapter 27. You know, it's kind of sped up the last couple chapters. But that they've not heard, it's possible. Some scholars, some theologians think it's because Israel, Jerusalem was like, well, we're not going to have a case in Rome, so who cares? We're happy he's left. We're happy he's gone. Something like that. It's possible that they really didn't hear. I'm not saying they're lying, per se. Um, again, time will tell, really. We don't, we don't know. <laughs> but we'll go with the benefit of the doubt and say they didn't hear. But the interesting thing is they know about it, and they say, tell us more. We're curious. What is this Christianity? Romans, of course, the book was written in 57, so about five, six years before our text here. And of course, there were already Christians in that time. Paul didn't plant that church. He doesn't meet many of them until right now in our chapter, like we saw last week. It's not clear exactly, at least from my reading. Maybe somebody smarter has seen that, but we don't really know how the church in Rome was established. But he's already writing you know, his big letter, 16 chapters, to the Roman church. And he wrote it about five years before. But the Christians are not spoken well of in Rome. And the synagogues, the Jewish people know that. But they're still interested. Why are they not spoken well of? Why? There's that curiosity. 
Flip over to uh, Philippians 1 for a moment. Keep your thumb there in Acts. Philippians 1, verse 12. Listen to this. This is one of the uh, prison epistles, right? Philippians, Colossians, Ephesians, Philemon. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me, now we know what's happened to Paul, right? Last few chapters, we know what's happened to him. Shipwrecked, the whole thing. He was almost scourged before that. Now he's in Rome. He's still in prison. I want you to know what's happened to me. This is so good. Just see Paul's character in this. Has really served to advance the gospel. That it has become known throughout the whole imperial or praetorian guard. It's basically like Caesar's SWAT team, his secret service. And all the rest, that my imprisonment is for Christ. And that most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Mm, that's good. We saw this through COVID to a degree, didn't we? We saw some churches getting arrested or cited or whatever, and more people were like, actually, that's ridiculous. We're going to stand up as opposed to cowering is what the enemy always wants with persecution. It actually emboldens Christians. So often it does. So often it strengthens us. Often we don't want it, and I'm never saying we should ever desire it, but it often not only cleanses and purges, but builds up the church as well. Flip back over to Acts 28. So next time you study Philippians or Colossians, Ephesians, Philemon, know that Paul's in prison. And he's here at the end of chapter 28 in Rome. So what's he say? Let's hear this, they say. Let's, let's hear this. And what does Paul do? He proclaims the truth to them. Point three then, verse 23. When they had appointed a day, so they set up a new meeting. All right, let's, let's talk about this more. They came to him in his lodging with greater numbers. There's that curiosity coming again from last point. Which is good. You know, and we want to be a fragrant aroma seasoned with salt. We want to do that for those around us as well. We want people to ask, why are you doing this? What is this church, this, this Jesus, this movement, this Christian, this thing, this Bible, whatever? From morning till evening. Here's Paul's character again. Look at what Luke says. From morning till evening. He, that is Paul, expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus. From where? The law of Moses and the prophets. Of course, the law of Moses, the first five books, the Pentateuch or the Torah and the prophets were really just the Old Testament. Paul is seeking to be faithful to the end. He doesn't give up on his people. In fact, the Roman church, or the Roman, uh, um, the, well, the Roman church that he writes to, chapters 9, 10, and 11, it's a very divisive section for many in theological circles and churches. But ultimately, Paul's point and passion is for his kinsmen according to the flesh. He says, I wish I were accursed for my kinsmen. I would go to hell for their sake. I don't know if I love anybody that much. <laughs> if I can be totally honest. To be apart from Christ, severed from Christ, but Paul would do that for people who hate him? Man. He's a better man than me. But we can see he's writing there, nine, chapters 9, 10, and 11, Paul's kind of treatise on this. Romans 10.3 is one point, if you're taking notes. That's a good one to look at later. But this ultimately shows a division yet again, as the gospel not only converts, but it always divides. And we see this time and time again throughout Acts. It not only converts sinners, but it also divides people. Some believe, some believe not, as the KJV says. Verse 25, then, this statement, this final statement is Acts, in Acts, uh, sorry, this final statement from Paul in Acts is the warning. They're hearing. And he's saying, we'll look at it here in a moment. But as we approach it, and I want to kind of drill down on point number three and four here in a sec. 
but he's, he's still passionate. He's still zealous. He's already written Romans five years before, but that passion is not waned. I wish I would go to hell for their sake. If they would be saved, I'd go to perdition. I'd go and be condemned. That's what Paul's saying in Romans 9, 10, and 11. And of course, the person he's objecting to or is objecting to Paul is a Jewish man mad that God is saving Gentiles. That's the point of Romans 9, 10, and 11. People want to get all mucked up with other things. That's not the point. The point is there's a Jewish people who are mad that God has forsaken them, but he's not really forsaken them. He's used them in continually providing through Christ that there is one people of God. That you have to come to God the Father through Jesus the Son and be filled thus with the Holy Spirit. That's the whole point. That's his point here. That's his point in Romans. That's his point throughout all of his writings. All being carried along by the Spirit. But I want to get... How much passion, how much convincing, gospel convincing. We've seen this time and time again with Paul. Some people I'll hear, well, we can't persuade people. Don't try and argue people into the kingdom. Well, tell that to the Apostle Paul. What is, a, what is persuading other than trying to convince somebody, arguing with them? We're not trying to insult people. We're not trying to be mean. Oh, you're going to go to hell if you don't believe. I mean, yeah, that's true. And maybe that comes to that, depending on the person, I suppose. But that shouldn't be our first tactic. <laughs> It should rather be love and kindness, seasoned with salt, right? Just like food is much better with salt. That's why the biblical analogy is there. Because ultimately what? Jesus is better than whatever system the unbeliever is using, or whatever they're trusting, or whatever they're in. That's the difference. And we've really lost that in the church nationally. That's just kind of this buffet of different options. And maybe Jesus, maybe not. No, no, not maybe not, or maybe Jesus. Only Christ. So let's live like it and live unto the Lord like it. And when we don't, we stumble and fall. We go back to him. That's what Paul is saying to them here. Jesus. And he's convincing them from morning till evening. It's a long sermon. Probably going back and forth, answering questions. He expounded. Listen to those words. Testifying. And not just their own felt needs, but from the Bible. (laughs) Go figure. He used the Bible. Many people and many preachers, pastors, you want to use that term loosely, want to say we don't need the Old Testament anymore. We need to unhitch it. We need to get rid of it. That's nonsense. That's heresy. That's dangerous. That's bad. Why? Well, because Paul's not doing that. Jesus didn't do that. Does that mean we're in the Old Covenant? No. But we should still learn from it. Christ, as some say, is on every page. Even if he's hidden, even if it's metaphor, even if it's illustration and analogy, Jesus is still there because the whole of the text of Scripture is about God and God revealing himself to people. So we don't ever unhitch it. I mean, it's 70% of our Bible, for goodness sakes, right? But look at this again with verse 25. Or, sorry, 24. Some were convinced. We've heard this. But others disbelieved. Some believed. Some believed not. Verse 25. Disagreeing amongst themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. And this is very condemning, but it's so true. And it's not the only time this scripture is referenced. This is Isaiah 6. Paul says the Holy Spirit, testifying of inspiration, he believes that The Holy Spirit wrote Isaiah, so there's a good point. In saying to your fathers, writing to the Jews specifically there, through Isaiah the prophet, go to this people and say, you will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. Why? Because God hates them? Is that what it says? God doesn't love them. God didn't provide for them. God's grace is not sufficient for them. Jesus' blood doesn't wash away their sin or can wash away their sin. Is that what it says? No. Not at all. So if there's systems and beliefs and writers and authors and pastors that say contrary to something even basic like this, they're the ones that are wrong, not the Scripture. Always. Don't yield to somebody's intelligence when it runs in completely counter to the Word of God. Ever. 27. These people's heart has grown dull. And with their ears... They can barely hear, and their eyes 
they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. Such a good passage. It's a warning, just as when we have children, or maybe, you know, you've got your grandkids in your house, you warn them. We see the, the, the road signs. You know, we're going around a turn, the yellow sign, you go 30 or whatever. If you go 80, probably going to crash. Don't go 80. <laughs> it doesn't mean it's not causing you to go 80, right? It's not causing you to crash either. You're the one who sees the warning and says, I'm going to yield that. I'm going to hear that and apply that to my life right now, especially when it's raining and dark, looking out for deer, right? Or coyotes. Go 80 and you're probably going to meet your end, right? Like, it's pretty straightforward. And really, that's the gospel call, isn't it? Repent and believe the gospel, turn to Jesus, and then embrace that and live that way. Or suffer the consequences. Like, it's, it's really that clear. But as I said, this is not the only time this is mentioned. Paul, of course, quoting Isaiah 6 to the Jewish leaders here. Many believe, by the way. Not all of them reject it, right? And praise God for that. And some of them might have come later on. We don't know. But Jesus quotes this in Luke 8.10, Matthew 13 and Mark 4.12. All those places, it's the same, similar situations. And then John also quotes it in John 12, not quoting Jesus, but it's a commentary after Christ talks. All in the same context. All about the Jewish people. God's elect chosen nation. Guys, why are you hardening your hearts, he says. Why have you closed your eyes? Why are you not listening? God's plea, he says to them. Turn and hear. And who would heal them? Who's going to heal them, church? God will. Not them, not Buddha or Muhammad or Allah or Zeus or Apollos. Not Hermes or Nike or Aphrodite or anybody else. God will do that. Yahweh, the living God, the one and true and only God. And by extension, that applies to us and everyone we know. When we turn, God heals us. He makes us new. He changes us. Gone are the old things. Behold, all is becoming new. It's similar to the prodigal son in Luke 15. I'll just read it briefly, so just to kind of fly over it. Luke 15, 27, he says, there's a servant, tells the older brother, this is later in the story, if you remember it, he says, your brother has come home. Talking to the older brother about the younger, your father has killed a fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he, that is the older brother, was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated to him. Look, the son says, these many years I have served you and I've never disobeyed your command, yet you've never given me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. And the father reminds him of who he is. Son. He doesn't say boy. He doesn't say something demeaning. He doesn't say, you know, another name. He says, son, you are always with me. And all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate, though. To be glad that your brother, who was dead, obviously he wasn't really dead, he was separated, he was gone, that's what deadness often is. He was dead and is alive. He was lost and now he's found. Israel is that older brother in the context that Jesus tells that story. And the father, of course, is God the Father. And he's calling out and saying, no, no, don't, don't act different, man. Come on, come on, son. No, this is all, no, let's rejoice that your foolish, dumb brother, your silly brother who wasted his life on loose living, right? He came back. Let's rejoice in that, he says. And yet... The older brother, by all accounts, at least how Christ kind of leaves the cliffhanger, we don't know if he came in and partied. We don't know if he celebrated or not. And in, in one sense, Israel, especially in the context there, the, the, it's still, you know, dot, dot, dot. It's still to be determined. And there are many Jewish people, ethnically Jewish today, that hate Jesus, just absolutely despise him. And it's no different than we see in, the, in Acts. 
It, the most of the antagonistic people in Acts are not the Romans or the Gentiles, the Greeks, but it's the Jewish establishment. Not everybody, thankfully. But it's like, it, it just confounds the mind. It, it, it's just... Just see God's passion. See His, His care, His love towards us messed up sinners. See, I, I hope that that comes across, church. It's not worthy. We're not worthy of these things, right? But He, we, like the prodigal child wandering away, coming back and just being thankful. Remember, what's, what's the young guy say? He said, well, I mean, maybe I'll, I mean, my dad's slaves are better than this. I'll go, I'll go be a slave, right? I don't expect anything. And he puts the robe, he puts the ring, he kills, has a big banquet, a big buffet, you know, caters everything. Prime rib for everybody, right? Party, music, everything. And the brother is mad. This is such a helpful picture, both this text and, of course, God's calling here back in Acts 28, quite, quoting 26 through 28 here, or 27. Referencing Isaiah chapter 6. Because it's God's zeal, it's his passion to save the lost. God's not wishing that any would perish, but all to come to repentance. What does that mean? Other than that he wants all to come to repentance. Like God's not duplicit, he's not a liar. All doesn't not mean all. He doesn't force people, but it also, at the same time, we're not free to just do whatever we want. We're stuck in a place and a time, born to certain parents, born in a particular place, living in a particular place. All these things. There's a lot of that we can't control, but what we can control is repenting and believing, as far as I can tell, because God gives that ability. Not our own ability, right? Not because I've mustered it, bootstrapped myself up, no. It's because God gives that ability. God does. God's always the initiator in salvation. There's so many other places. Acts 19, I won't go there. Acts 19.8, that's a great passage as well. Kind of referencing similar to this. Romans 9, like I said. That's where he says he wished he would be a curse. Romans 9.3, particularly, again, if you're writing that down. I love what MacArthur says here. He says, the whole book of Acts is the story of God's final striving with the Hebrew people. From the time he called Abraham to the point now, he has been striving with Israel, end quote. Just as the Father does, just as Isaiah is quoting, and Paul quotes to them, to their face, from Isaiah, hundreds and hundreds of years after being written, not taking things out of context, still in the same context, and say, look, there's a time, there's a place, Salvation is now. Repentance is now. Today is the day of salvation, not tomorrow. God would heal them. And again, it applies to us, by extension to us. Though we're not Jewish, no, but the same God who saves them is the same God who saves today. We see that reversal here as our fourth point. They're taking it, and now they're, it's going back, and now it's going to go to the Gentiles, which we'll see. Doesn't mean Jewish people can't be saved. Doesn't mean they've you know, squandered it, per se. But it means now that they've shunned it. They've hardened their hearts. And we know when you harden that, just like concrete, the more you wait to do what you want to do with the concrete, the harder it is to mess with, right? It's like that when you're raising children. Anything else. You know, it's, it's soft when it's new, when it's fresh. Our hearts are soft when we're born, as it were. doesn't mean we're sinless. doesn't mean we're perfect. But that's why Jesus calls us to be like children, right? Come to him like a child. Our last point. Oh, excuse me. Sorry. Verse 28. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. They will listen. Some manuscripts have the verse 29. It's not in my Bible, technically. And 
We can talk about that another time if you want. But it says, and he said these words, the Jews departed, having much dispute amongst themselves. There's a couple times in Acts where certain older manuscripts we have, this verse exists, but this verse doesn't. Don't be rattled in your faith. Don't lose heart. All of them are either referencing something that's kind of already happened, or they're affirming something else as far as doctrine. It's not like all of a sudden this one says, and Jesus isn't God, <laughs> you know, or, and there's more than one way of salvation. Like nothing, I mean, even in the end of chapter or uh, the gospel of Mark, same thing. There's some manuscripts that don't have the ending of Mark. If you look in your Bible, like it ends at chapter uh, verse nine. None of those things, though, change any Christian doctrine, even in the slightest. I mean, as we just read, some of them believed and departed. Well, we already read that. Luke already wrote that. Oftentimes, and just as an explanation for an aside, remember they're writing down by hand, you know, 1,500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, there's no printing press yet. They would write comments, just like you might write in your Bible today. And your great-grandchildren might find that and be like, what did Grandma mean? Does she mean like that needs to be corrected or, you know, whatever? We'll probably, let's add it just in case. Because they didn't want to lose it. It wasn't a value that they, or they didn't value the scripture. They, they valued it so much, they're like, maybe that should be in there. So that's where sometimes you'll get extra things. And those were written later. And the reason why oftentimes Bibles don't have them is because we find earlier manuscripts where those notes aren't there, which implies they weren't original, if that makes sense. Hope that makes sense. If not, ask me after. So that's why sometimes you get those little things or, hey, where's, where's verse 10 or where's verse 28? So a couple applications for us as we finish this up. And we'll see this with the continuation of the gospel. I'll, I'll just read verse 30 and 31 now. He lived two more years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. I put dot, 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 <laughs> you know, because it's still, we don't, that's it. It doesn't end as abruptly, you know, Jonah or, or, or some of the other, I think first John, you know, keep yourselves from idols, right? Like he just kind of writes it in at the last moment. Jonah really seems like there's more, but we don't have it. If you go back and maybe read it this afternoon or this week, you know, Jonah's a great little book and it just kind of, it's like you just turned off the movie, like 20 minutes left. You're like, I don't, what happened? <laughs> but, and it seems like that with Acts, it's just kind of like, I don't. Did I, is it, where's, is there a third book? Like, what's going on? Did Luke have a volume three, right? I mean, I, maybe it's just me, but Paul's still doing the thing. The gospel is going to the Gentiles. He's preaching with boldness without hindrance. Praise God. What, I don't, what happened? Where's Paul? Like, did he get, what happened? Did he get out? Did he, I don't know. Do you feel like that? Yeah, I mean, I do. It's weird, right? In one sense. But this is what we have. And, and really, the gospel's still moving, isn't it? The Holy Spirit, he's still working. He's still convicting and encouraging both the world and the church. Seems like there's more. Seems like there should be more. But in one sense, you might be so bold to say we're, we're living that. We're living the more. Because people are still being saved, aren't they? Churches are still being planted. People are still being baptized. The mission of Christ that was started in Acts 1 is continuing. So a couple things. First, we should see Paul's evangelistic zeal. See his proclamation and his passion for the true gospel. Something that we can emulate as well. Another thing, we can ask ourselves how we live with the unbelievers around us. How Paul is doing that, or anybody else for that matter, but in our text looking at even this week and going into Christmas and having meals with people and other things. How are we interacting with unbelievers around us? If you're like me, sometimes it's kind of like, ah, I don't, I don't, nah. I don't want to bother. But the whole world will know that you're my disciples for your love for one another, right? Even if that includes just your spouse or your friend or somebody here. But our attitudes, our actions matter a lot. I think sometimes more than we give it credit. But how are we interacting with other people? How is Paul doing it? We can emulate him. And then lastly, consider how Paul relates to the Israelites. Those according 
to the flesh. Notice he says brothers, right? He's not talking about Christians. We see that in verse 17. He's talking about his flesh. How do we relate to our fellow American, right? Now, we have a much more hodgepodge group of people compared to, you know, ethnic Israel. But in one sense, we're no different, right? We have people from all backgrounds, different ethnicities. How do we relate to them? And we all have a particular, and I would kind of narrow it even more, we all have a particular affinity and like hobby. We have a people, right? How do you relate to your people? I don't know your people, if you will. Maybe it's just people in this county. Maybe it's people who like this thing. Maybe it's people you worked with or used to or work with now. Maybe it's people who like any number of hobbies. How do you relate to those people? And then a second point of main application. This is also a warning to those who are outside of Christ. We can see that those who are constantly hearing the word and hardening their hearts, God gives them up. There's no time limit. There's no amount of sin. There's no percentage, right? In one sense, that's great. Because God's the one who's going to heal. He always promises, and his promises are faithful, right? They're, they're consistent and good. They're tr to be trusted. But he's telling them here and by extension people today to not harden your hearts. Just as the road, you know, says 30 and not 80, don't go 80, right? And you want to go 80? Yeah, people do go 80. See what happens. But that's truly the gospel, right? Repent and believe the gospel or suffer the consequences. I mean, it's, it's really that simple. And then when we do that, I know, you know, we are in Christ, those of us walking with him, let's be reminded of those things, right? Not groveling and sad, or we have a bitter, angry father, you know, a grumpy, a grumpy dad on the porch, you know, yelling at us and throwing stuff at us. No, we have the God who's the God pictured that Jesus is telling the prodigal son, the buffet, the, the fattened calf, the robe, the ring, you are a child of God, church. Remember that. It's easy to forget it, isn't it? It's easy to forget it, that you're a daughter or a son of the king when you're in him because the world, the flesh, and the devil assail us, attacks us, wears us down, lies to us, etc. Worrying, diseases, toils, and snares, all these strifes, all these things often worry us and proclaim to us that Christ is not king. He's not on the throne. You're believing a lie, right? And just for a moment, we might act like it, don't we? That person's not who they say they are, whatever. No. Let us believe and hope and endure all things because love never fails. Remember that, church. Acts is not done in one sense. It's a dot, dot, dot. I hope this is a book that we've studied and will drive you to further studying other parts of Scripture, especially Paul's letters, knowing where he is, especially writing several of these prison epistles, and seeing that it is that umbrella, right, that God gives us kind of like the, the puzzle pieces, you know, and it all fits together. It's not just disjointed and just kind of cobbled together. Christ is king. Last week we looked at hope. This week we're looking at peace. Let's rest in that. Let's know that Christ brings us peace. Peace with God. Peace despite our sin. Right? Despite our brokenness, our fallenness, our routine turning like the prodigal son. If we turn back, what does he do? He will heal us. I'm going to pray and I'm going to just read a brief thing and Sam will come light the two candles. Let's pray first. Oh, God and Father, thank you, Lord. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. 